Last couple of days, we've been talking about momentum and a couple of different aspects of it. Solving problems involving constant velocity momentum, solving problems involving changing momentum where the ball was being dropped, solving problems involving variable value changing. I want to go back to those problems where the momentum was changing. The ball was being dropped from the top of a building and hitting the ground. What was the final momentum as it struck the ground? We found momentum at a specific moment in time. That's what momentum is. It's a property of an object at a specific moment in time. But there are times when that momentum is changing. We have to have a way of quantifying that change in momentum. Today we're going to learn about that. Impulse, the term impulse is defined as the change in the momentum that's experienced by the object. The change in the momentum of the ball as it fell from the roof of the building down to the ground. The change in the momentum of the semi-truck as it started from rest at the stop sign until it reached 100 kilometers per hour on the highway. The change in the momentum of the ball as it fell from the roof to the ground. The change in momentum of the airplane as it was flying at cruising, out, cruising speed and ended up stopping at the terminal. Momentum we found at specific moments in time. Impulse we find over a period of time, over a time interval, because it's the change in momentum. It's a vector. Look, if momentum is a vector, then the change in momentum also has to be a vector. Now, I want to derive an equation here for you. You're not likely going to have to derive this on a test or even on a quiz, but I want to derive it for you so that you know where it comes from, because that's important. How many people from remember from Physics 20, Newton's, Newton's three laws? Yeah? A couple of people's hands up. Probably a few people more, more than that remember. I just don't want to say it. Um, what's Newton's first law? Alex, what was Newton's first law? you remember? More or less, at least. It doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah, it was. An object, an object at rest stays at rest. An object in motion stays in motion until acted upon by an unbalanced force. It's the law of inertia, right? Everything wants to keep doing what it's doing until acted upon by an unbalanced force. It doesn't want to change what it's doing. It wants to keep its current state of motion. That's Newton's first law. Newton's third law, we'll skip one here. Newton's third law was for every action, yeah. I don't actually like that way of saying Newton's third law. I like if object A applies a force on object B, object B applies an equal and opposite force on object A. But they're both right. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction is correct as well. Newton's second law was simply F is equal to M times A. Let's write that down. Newton's second law, F equals MA. But now let's do something to it. Is that okay? Am I allowed to do that? Have I done anything against the rules of mathematics here? If A is delta V over delta T, then there's no reason I shouldn't be able to sub in delta V over delta T for acceleration, right? Let's rearrange it now. Let's take the delta T up on multiplying. Becomes F times delta T equals M times delta V. So far, so good? One more quick and easy question. What's M times V equal to? What's MV? It's momentum. Okay. If MV is momentum, then what's M times change in V or delta V? Change in momentum or impulse. So we're saying here that M times delta V is impulse. It's the change in the momentum. It's the impulse. Well, you can see here that F times delta T is also delta P. If we take a step back from that, it should make some sense to us, right? What do you have to do to change the momentum of something? There's an airplane flying in the sky. What has to happen to change the momentum of that airplane? There's a hockey puck sitting on the ice. 
what has to happen in order to change the momentum of that occupy? You have to apply a force, right? You got to push it or pull it. So impulse depends upon force and what else? Well, if you push on that hockey puck for longer, you change the momentum by more, right? So it depends upon the force that you apply, but also how long you apply that force for. So impulse is m times delta v, but it depends upon the product of the force and the time. I want you to look at your data sheet. It's the bottom left-hand corner. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner the first equation that we learned this year, p is equal to m times v. But you also see this one. This is the one, more or less, that we just learned. It doesn't say delta p beside it. It doesn't say the word impulse beside it. But that's what it is. m times delta v is the impulse. f times delta t is the impulse. So you're just going to have to remember that really there should be a delta p beside all of that. Now, when are we going to use this to solve a problem? When are we going to use this new concept? Well, it's not really a new concept, actually. It's Newton's second law, right? This is really just Newton's second law. So we're going to use it whenever Newton's second law was available to us to solve a problem. We can use this instead of f is equal to m times a now, if we want. But there's a couple of specific cases that we tend to like to use this for. First one, when a problem asks for impulse, I don't think that's too difficult. If a problem says, calculate the impulse, blah, 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 then of course you're going to use impulse, right? If it asks for impulse, or, or it asks for change in momentum, because really, the change in momentum is just the impulse. Or maybe it asks you for momentum gain or momentum lost. Those all mean exactly the same thing. So if you see any of those things, use this. Use the impulse equation. Now the other one's a little less obvious. If we see a force and we see a time in the same question, we use impulse. Now, that might seem obvious right now to you. Look, the equation has f and t in it. But you often see there, when you see a problem with force and time in it, is that it doesn't mention the word impulse. It doesn't even mention the word momentum in the entire problem. But yet, we can still use impulse to solve the problem. Whenever you see a force, Whenever you see a time, it doesn't matter whether you've got force and time or you're looking for force and you've got time or whatever the combination is. If both of them are in the problem, you can use impulse to solve the problem. Okay, let's have a look at a problem here. 9.3 on 458. It says, to improve the safety of motorists, modern cars are built so that the front end crumples upon impact. So what they're saying here is that cars are designed to be destroyed. They are. We call that a crumple zone. And we want crumple zones in cars. Cars today have crumple zones. All of them do. It's mandatory. 30, 40 years ago, cars didn't have crumple zones. They were big, and they were strong, and they didn't get destroyed in crashes. You got destroyed in crashes. Okay, you're much less likely to be injured now in a crash than you were 40 years ago in a crash, even though the car disintegrates almost now, and it didn't then. Why are they important? Well, we're going to see that in a minute. A 1,200 kilogram car is traveling at a constant velocity of 8 meters per second east, hits a wall, comes to a complete stop in 0.25 seconds. What's the impulse provided to the car? What's the force exerted on the car? And for the same impulse, different time, what's the new force? Let's worry about A and B first. C is kind of a after the fact because we're changing something, changing the time. Let's worry about A and B here. And let's circle some givens here first. This is going to be our mass. This is going to be a velocity. But what velocity is it? Is it V? Is it VI? Or is it VF? Yep. Just, just V because it's a constant velocity. Is that right? No, it's actually not just V. 
this is we got to read. This is where we got to read the question carefully and and internalize the question, understand the question, okay, and not just look for a given per se. Okay, this question says the stem of the question says that the straw made constant velocity. It hits a wall and stops. What's the important part of this question? When it's traveling at a constant velocity or when it's stopping? When it's stopping. So that means the speed is changing, isn't it? That means that's not going to be V. That's going to be good. It's going to be VI. Little things like that, guys, right? We've got, to be, we've got to be aware of. Don't just read a word like, oh, constant velocity. Oh, OK. Got it. Like, look at the bigger picture. Look at the context here. Here's my time. Anything else if I read between the lines? I see something else if I read between the lines. Michael? BF is what? Good. Car comes to a stop, right? Good. We're looking for the impulse delta P, and we're looking for the force F. Okay. In the first case, we know you're going to use impulse because we're asked for impulse. In the second case, we know we're going to use impulse because we got a force and we got a time. Impulse for both of them. For the first one, let's say delta P is equal to, um, let's say it's M times delta V. We can make it F times T, but let's make it M times delta V here. M is 1,200. Delta V is zero, final, minus initial. 8, which gives me uh, negative 9.6 times 10 to the 3 kilograms meters per second. Or you could say 9.6 times 10 to the 3 to the west. Negative impulse, by the way, means momentum is lost. You could also think of it as the impulses to the west. Want to find the force? Hey, look, we've got another part of the equation we can use here. It was m times v delta v, but it's also m times or f times delta t. Can anybody explain to me why I used the same impulse as I did in the first question? Why did I use the same impulse? Why didn't I have to find that impulse in question B? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course it's going to be the same impulse, right? Same situation. Nothing's changed, right? Nothing's changed. The impulse isn't going to change either. Negative 9.6 times 10 to the 3 divided by 0.25 is? Um, 3.84, 3.84, negative 3.84, or negative 3.8 times 10 to the 4, I think. Somebody check that. Pretty big force. Let's try C. The only difference between B and C is the number for time. We're going to say this time F is equal to delta P over T. Delta P is negative 9.6 times 10 to the 3. Delta T is 0 0.04. Hey, somebody explain to me now why delta P isn't changing. The situation has changed now, right? The time is a lot smaller than it was before. Why is delta P the same? Nathan? Yeah, look, the mass, the initial velocity, and the final velocity haven't changed. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. An object that stops will experience the same impulse no matter how it stops. No matter whether it hits a concrete wall or whether it comes to a gradual stop at a stop sign. No matter whether it has a crumple zone or not. Tony, can you do me a favor? You stand up on your desk. On the count of three, you're going to jump off your desk onto the floor this way so people can see you. Okay, one, two, three. What did Tony do when he landed? Why did he bend his knees? 
Okay. The impulse experienced by Tony is the same, no matter whether he bends his knees or not, right? His initial velocity, his final velocity, and his mass are the same no matter what, right? It's not impulse that hurts his knees. It's force that hurts his knees. And in just a second, we're going to see that increasing the stopping time by bending his knees decreases the force. That's what hurts, the force, not the impulse. Okay, you do the division here, uh, and what do we end up getting? Five? Look, bigger time, smaller force. Smaller time, bigger force. Who plays a sport here? Like what? What do you play? Hockey. Okay. Rugby. Anybody play like uh, baseball or basketball? Not even competitively, but just everybody's. Yeah. yeah. What? Which is it? Baseball. Okay. When you catch a ball, Alex, how do you catch the ball? Okay. Ball's coming towards you. Okay. What happens is the ball hits your glove. You do, but you, but. But you do this without even thinking about it. You kind of move your hand back a little bit. Okay? You kind of absorb it, right? And to the non-physics people, they're going to say, well, why do you do that? Well, because we want to absorb the force, right? Well, to the physics people, we're going to say, look, the impulse of the ball is going to be the same. No matter whether you do that or not with your hand, right? The impulse will be the same. That doesn't matter. But if you bring your hand back, it increases the stopping time, which doesn't do anything to the impulse, but does something to the force. It decreases the force. So it hurts your hand less, right? Plus, it's less likely to bounce out of your glove if it's less force. That makes sense? Anybody ever been in a car crash where the airbag's going off? No? Good. I'm glad none of you have. You guys know what the purpose of an airbag is? Yeah, your head is moving. It could hit the steering wheel. It could hit the airbag. Hey, the impulse is going to be the same no matter what. But if it hits the steering wheel, it stops pretty quickly. If it hits the airbag, it stops over a much bigger period of time, which makes the force less. Anything that's stopping, it can be described by this, this concept here, right? Increase stopping time, decrease the force. Right? Hockey helmets. Hockey helmets also have the effect of spreading the force over a bigger area as well, but the cushioning inside is to increase the stopping time, decrease the force. That make sense? Okay, let's give you a few questions to work on on that. Page 458, please.